continuing in our journey series, this Jesus journey that we're on. And uh, our first week, our message was called Surviving the Storm. And we talked about how Jesus told his disciples to get in the boat, go to the other side, storm heads, he's asleep. They're worried. We're going to die. He's sleeping. We learned that we need to remember the promises, presence, peace, and power of Jesus. The next week was called Among the Tombs. They get to the other side. The crazy guy comes out. Remember, he got all the demons in him. And uh, they even go into a herd of pigs. They maybe drown themselves. And we saw that Jesus sees us. He cares about us. Cares for us. And we should proclaim him. Last week we looked at when we lose all hope. Where we said that Jesus comes to us where we are. And we looked at the three no's, no fear, no commotion, and no death. When we have Jesus and the hope he brings, we have no fear. There's no commotion and no death. Today's message is called Miracles on Miracles. Million little miracles, miracles on miracles, count your miracles, one, two, three, four, I can't even count them all. Okay, Todd's message is miracles on miracles. That's part of the song, I really like, by the way. We're in the book of Mark, still, chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 30 through 56. Now, I'm not going to read all the verses. We're going to, I'm going to tell you some of them. We're going to read parts of them, okay? We have a lot of reading to read all of those. Now, chapter 6 starts off with Jesus returning home, and on the Sabbath he begins to teach, and instead of the people accepting him, they begin to criticize him. Well, where did he get this kind of knowledge? Isn't that just Mary's kid? Aren't these his brothers? Aren't those his sisters right in verse 5 it said that Jesus could do nobody works there except a few remember that as we go through so Jesus and his disciples they leave and he sent his 12 out to do miracles in his name and then Jesus hears about Herod and, and how he took the head of John the, ba John the Baptist I'm paraphrasing a whole bunch here okay and then in verse 30, the disciples come back and tell Jesus all the things they had done in verse 31. Jesus says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. How many times do you get to sit down and leisurely eat your meal? Nobody calling you, knocking at your door. Coming by saying, heal me. They had no time, no leisure, even to eat. That's a very important verse. Jesus and his disciples were so busy with people, they didn't have time to sit and eat. Talk about eating on the go. If you got to eat at all. I've had times in my ministry when I was so busy day and night that I had no idea how I was going to get ready for Sunday, let alone what I was going to preach. This week hasn't been real busy, but it's been a, a circus on, the, on my sermon. I had a sermon ready to go. and Okay, Lord. I'm hearing you. So I trashed it. Start over. Okay, that's good. Okay, Lord, I'm hearing you again. I, I like that sermon was good. The direction was good, but where it ended up wasn't where it needed to be, so I trashed the last half of it and then continued on. So I finished it last night. That just sometimes the way things go, all right? You know, when Jesus 
we just walked down the street. We read last week how there's just crowds of people around him trying to just touch him. Disciples tried to do what they, they couldn't do much. Man, they were just worn out. Jesus says, hey, get in the boat. Let's go to a desolate place. Okay, remember desolate place. No town. No houses. Desert. Desolate place. I'm going to look at four points this morning. As I said, I'm not going to read all the verses, so you know where I'm going. You can go home and read all of them. All right, all of chapter 6. Number one, Jesus has compassion. So chapter 6, verses 32 and 30 through 34. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Okay, you get the picture here. Let's get in the boat. Let's go to a desolate place by ourselves so we can just get some rest. We can pray. And these people, they see where they're going and, hey, let's go. Not only them, but people just started, okay, hey, everybody's going. And they're there waiting on him. Hi, Jesus. How y'all doing? Great. Right? But Jesus, he does what? He has compassion. He has compassion. He said, they're like a sheep. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is trying to get some downtime, a bit of R&R. &R. He gets his disciples, they get in the boat, they get there, and people are waiting for them. The crowd grows bigger than it was to start with. Remember now, it's a desolate place. And they get there, it's not just a crowd now, it is a multitude of people. A multitude. Jesus goes on shore, he has compassion. Why? Because, as I said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am what? The good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. That's why he had compassion. Had it been most of us, it would have been like, are right, you kidding? Stay in the boat. Go that way. Let's see if they can run through water. Not Jesus. He had compassion. And he began to what? Teach. He began to teach. Number two, Jesus always commands the impossible. They just take you by surprise. Jesus always commands the impossible. Verses 35 through 40. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Well, they went to a desolate place, right? Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside, villages, and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, Jesus, you give them something to eat. Okay. Now, it's hard to read and hear the affliction, but when you study this out, Jesus just commanded them. There was a command. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 and 200 and narrow worth of bread and give it them to, to them to eat? Now, just a little side note here. If they had had enough money, they didn't. If they would have had enough money, they could not have found enough food to buy to feed all these people. It was a multitude. 5,000 men. That day and day time, they just counted the men. How many of them had their wives with them? How many of them had their kids with them? 
This could have been 15 or 20,000 people. They could not buy enough bread to feed all these people. Where are we going to buy enough bread for them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. I'm sure the disciples are going. Peter, how many loaves do you have? Loaves? Are you kidding me? How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Okay. Two miracles here. One, they found green grass in a desolate place. Number two, he commands these men to sit down in groups and they actually accomplished that. That was a joke. You can laugh later. So they sit down in groups of hundreds and by fifties. Okay? Now, he has commanded them to get some food for them. They go and they find a little boy's lunch. Five loaves, two fish. Keep in mind, when we see this in movies, it all just gets weird. Because five loaves, you're like, oh man, these big round loaves of bread. And these are nice big fish. Why would a little boy have great big loaves of bread and great big fish? It was his lunch. It was like hush puppies, maybe as big as a muffin. And two small fish. It was his lunch. That is what they found. They haven't sit down in groups, fifties, hundreds. So they sit down in groups. By the way, why does Jesus command the impossible? You heard me say Jesus always commands the impossible. Did you ask yourself why? Why does Jesus always command the impossible? Let me tell you, it's because he intends to do the work. Anytime Jesus has you do something, it's because he intends to do the work. He may do it through you, but he will do the work. He commands that you feed him. All right? 41 through 44. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples and set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. They, and they all ate and were satisfied. Everybody ate and got their belly full. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. Broken pieces and of the fish, and those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Now then, when movies are made of this, they always get it so wrong. Because it shows these loaves and fish, and Jesus lifts up the baskets, and he prays. They come back and these baskets are just overflowing. It didn't happen. Why? We just read, and he broke the two fish. These weren't quails. How did this happen? Let me tell you. Jesus took it, he blessed it, and then he broke it. Remember I said we use broken things? If it didn't broke, Jesus is going to break it so he can use it. He took a muffin and he broke it in half. Hey, Peter, take this. John, you take that. Do what I did. Now, these, these 12 disciples have lots of common sense. And they're going to go, well, this won't take long. How did you see Peter going, do what I did? Do what I did. I'm going to break my half in half. Here, you take that knee. Now I'm going to, wait, I've still got a half. I'm going to break my half in half. I've still got a half. 
You see disciples getting excited because they're doing what Jesus did. It's been blessed. Only what is blessed can multiply. And then it's broken. Right? Jesus said, do what I did. He broke it. So they broke it. And it just kept multiplying. Then he took the two fish. He broke the two fish in here. And that fish. And they're like, sushi. And they start breaking up the fish and giving it to the people. They're like, it just keeps multiplying in my hand. In the disciples' hands, it multiplied. It did multiply when Jesus blessed it and just all of a sudden had overflow of food. Can you imagine him trying to hold up enough food to feed 15 or 20,000 people? No. The disciples are just getting so excited, man. They're breaking this in half and giving it to them. Ah, they got it. And they're so excited. And the people kept eating. This was, this was, well, like a church dinner. They just kept eating. <laughs> and they kept breaking it half and handing it out. And disciples ate. You know, the disciples could have eaten their little boys' lunch and been done. None of them would have had enough to eat. It would have been gone. Instead, they gave it to Jesus. He blessed it. He broke it. And then they broke it. And they just kept breaking it, handing out more and more and more and more. And then, just to prove his point, Jesus says, get these baskets. How big are the baskets? We don't know. But I'm going to tell you this right here. Every basket full was more food than they started with. Why 12 baskets? Because there's 12 disciples. These disciples going, look at these leftovers. Look at these leftovers. Miracles on miracles. They're all holding their baskets, whether it's just a flat basket or a big basket. We don't know, but they're full. And each disciple's going, Oh, cool. I'm sure that's the language they use. <laughs> Number three. Jesus sees you. Verses 45 through 52. Immediately he made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. Then while he dismissed the crowd. Now I've got to stop this right here because verse 45 shows us urgency. Okay? When you study out these words in the Greek, it is urgency. He immediately, here's your parting gift, here's your basket, here's your parting gift, here's your basket. Get in the boat, go. Remember the crowd ran and followed him? Get in the boat and go. I will stay here. I will dismiss the crowd. The two words in this that are urgent words is immediately and dismissed. He immediately says, get in the boat, and then he dismissed the crowd with the to say, okay, you can go now. It's late. It's getting dark. Boogie. Okay? Those are the two words that are urgent words. The urgency may have been the only way to get the crowd to go. Okay? Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone, on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, catch this. You think Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor? Just watch this. He came to walk on the sea. He meant to pass by them. You ever notice that before? He meant to pass by the boat where they were rowing so hard because the wind was against them, he could have walked by the boat. Walking on the rough waters. He's going to walk by. See, 
I see Jesus having a sense of humor here. What happens next? But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost who cried out, Ah, it's a ghost! Seriously? For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. West Texas words, I'm not a ghost. Calm down. What happens next? And he got in the boat with them, and the wind ceased. Wow, second time. First time they had to wake him up. This time he's walking by the boat. He's making better time walking than they are rowing. He gets in the boat, and the wind ceases. And they were utterly astonished. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They didn't understand what Jesus did with the loaves and fish. Couldn't get a hold of it. There's urgency in the first verse we read. Why was Jesus so urgent? John 6, 15 says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Why was there urgency? Get in the boat, get going. Hey, y'all can leave now. Everything's over. Please leave. Because he perceived, they're about to say, we need to make him king Jesus. Oh, not King Jesus like we had King Jesus, but an earthly king. And that's not why he came. He finally dismisses the crowd and he goes up on the mountain to pray. He goes up by himself to pray. Sometimes you've got to get rid of people so you can just go talk to the Father. Evening comes, Jesus saw they were making headway painfully. Painfully, for the wind was against them. Jesus goes walking on the water where they are working so hard to get to. They are rowing with all they have. And here comes Jesus. As I said, he meant to pass by. If you study the Gospel of Mark in the original text, you realize they were afraid their little boat was about to sink. The sea was rough enough that they were afraid. And here comes Jesus. What we don't see here is Peter walking on the water. Why? Because Matthew recorded that. Mark didn't. Okay? He sees them making headway painfully. Those guys in that boat that night, they were working for all they could work. They were mingling their sweat with the waves that were breaking over the sides of this little boat they were in. They were straining at the oars, and they actually thought they were going down. But he saw them. He saw them laboring and striving and rowing. I love that. He saw them. They saw him, thought it was a ghost. He saw them and had compassion. He could have walked on by, see you when you get there. But he had compassion, so he steps in the boat and the wind cease. Then they were all terrified. Right? Verses 50 and 50, 51, they're all, they saw him, they're all terrified. They thought it was a ghost, but he speaks to them. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. He gets in the boat, the wind sees. Only Mark records it this way. Then we find that he comes to them, he gets in the boat, wind sees, and they were what? Utterly astonished. Does it seem to you that by now they should not be utterly astonished anymore? 
Sometimes it seems to me they're a little bit slow in the uptake. Really? You saw him talk to a dead girl and she gets up, walks around, eats food. And she was not a zombie. You saw him raise the dead. You see him walking on water. You saw him talk to the waves and the wind and he just stopped. You see him get in the boat and the wind stopped. You just saw him feed a multitude of people and you're utterly astonished? Have we ever seen Jesus do something really amazing? He saw them, and he sees you too. Number four, Jesus is genuine. Now, in these last verses of chapter six, Jesus, they get to the shore, and the people recognize Jesus and recognize those with him, and they just start dragging out everybody who's sick. Everybody who's lame, who's deaf, who's blind, it doesn't matter. They're, they drag them out, put them in the streets, on the roadways. They didn't just bring them from the town. They, the, the Bible says the entire region, where he went, they were waiting on him. All these sick people, all these people who were whatever was wrong with them were waiting on him. Why? So they could just touch him and be healed. And that's why we don't know how many hundreds of people Jesus healed right here in verses 53 through 56. We don't know how many hundreds there were. The Bible itself tells us that everything Jesus did, his few short years while he was in ministry, was recorded. There would not be room enough in this earth to contain all the books. Right here, he healed hundreds of people. If you'd walk up to these people and say, can I get a witness? They'd be like, oh yeah, I'm first. No, you're not. I am. No, I'm not. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. As many as touched his hymn were made well. You know what? When we get real with Jesus, we can see and understand just how real and genuine He really is. He is genuine. I have a taste this morning. I want you to listen to me. Jesus has compassion for us. Jesus always commands the impossible. Because he wants us to have faith in him. Jesus is genuine. He is more genuine than anyone or anything on this earth. And Jesus sees you right where you are today. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what situation you may be in. You may be in a difficult place right now. You, you may be sitting alone in a corner of darkness. You may be facing temptation or proper or 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 proper or problems that are just too big, too great for you to bear. You may find yourself out on a stormy sea, afraid your little boat's going to be going down. I got some good news for you, believer. He saw them making painful, making headway painful. He saw them making headway. Painfully. He sees us making headway painfully. He sees you. He knows your problems. You don't have to set up a flare to let him know. He already knows. I pray that today you might commit your way to him in a very definite way. See, it's something all of us need to do. Especially in times of darkness, is commit ourselves to him in a definite way. We need to commit our way to Him. 
Where are you at today? Where are you at today? What problems are you facing that you cannot face alone? What mountain is staring you in the face? Jesus knows. He already knows. He sees you laboring. He knows how you feel. And he's waiting for you to turn to him. Even as believers, sometimes we forget he's here for us. Sometimes we think we can handle this on our own. But if we wait, our little boat's going to go down. And we're going to go down in a heap. Won't you let him help you today? Right now? Let's pray. Father, this morning, wherever we are, I ask you, Father, that each person in here, they get real with you, Lord. They get real with you. Whatever is going on in their life, I ask you, Father, just to take that. Take them. Send your Holy Spirit to work on them. On us. So we turn to you and we stop doing it our way. Let us do it your way. Let's turn it over to you. Father, you can handle it. You can handle it. And I thank you that you can. It will just turn to you. As we begin to sing this morning, and as you stand, ask yourself, what is it in my life I've been trying to handle on my own? I need to turn over to God. Whatever it is today, He can help.